Thanks for joining us today on Apostolic Pentecostal Channel. We are here to provide new and classic sermons weekly. We have tried to remaster and restore these sermons. Thanks for joining us. Please like, comment, and subscribe. May Yahweh's blessings be with you. Christ. Without that blood, you and I, we wouldn't even be here. We wouldn't have access to the holy presence of God. Wouldn't be able to be rid of the shame and guilt of our past. But thank God for the blood. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Um, at this time, we're going to ask the ushers to come. In case you didn't know, it is Old Fashioned Sunday. So if you see some people in a tire that's a couple decades old, maybe even a couple centuries old. Don't be alarmed. We haven't gone crazy. It's just, it's that time of year. So uh, turn to a neighbor. If you're near someone, let them know that it's good to see them in the house of the Lord. Amen. God is faithful. I'm glad to be in the house. Let's ask God to bless this offering before we give it in Jesus name thank you Lord for this day Lord thank you for your love and mercy Jesus thank you for your blood that you allowed to be shed on that hill Lord we ask you in Jesus name to bless this gift Lord this offering as we give it back to you Lord multiply it and make it something great for your kingdom hallelujah in Jesus name we pray amen may the Lord bless you as you give
I say it's all right to be old fashioned. It's all right to be old fashioned. Um, today we're going to be continuing our series on meeting the master. And uh, Javon spoke so well last Sunday. And I'm just going to continue in that vein. I'm going to be reading from John chapter 2, verse 1 through 10. And uh, today we're going to be talking about the yielded life. Everybody say the yielded life. The yielded life. The yielded life. That's what we're going to be talking about for the next 30 minutes. So John chapter 2, 1 through 10, it's on the screen. It says, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Everybody say, There's no wine. No wine. Woman, why do you involve me? <laughs> Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. Everybody say yielded. yielded. We're talking about the yielded life today. A car eases into the intersection. The sound of screeching Breaks and the tinkling of broken glass as two cars come to a halt. Sirens and red and blue lights race across the night sky. Two damaged vehicles. Who was at fault? It was the driver who failed to yield the right of way. The driver's failure to honor a yield sign had placed him at fault. And no matter how many excuses come up between that interaction with the police, the police know whoever didn't take caution at the yield sign, whoever didn't stay there when the sign said to yield, it's their fault. Now, how many love taking trips? How many love taking trips? Uh, has anybody taken a trip this summer yet? All right. Let's get some. Sarah, where would you take a trip to? took Texas. Where did you take a trip to? Stillville, Missouri. Sister Debbie? Tennessee. Come on. My bread and butter. South Carolina. All the way to South Carolina. Anybody else? Anybody else plan it? Sister Patty? Wyoming. Whoa. Uh, anybody else planning on taking a trip this summer? Zach? Texas? Cool. Anybody else? Seattle? I thought you were going to say South Carolina again. <laughs> Anybody else planning on taking a trip? Go ahead, brother. Come on. Come on now. All right. Well, LaSandra and I this summer, we took a trip to Chicago. It's one of our places to go to. It's only five hours away, you know, so it's not that far. You don't have to stay in a hotel, you know, on your way there, uh, like if you're going to the West Coast or the East Coast. Um, but LaSandra and I actually lived there for a year. Um, about six years ago, and we love we love Chicago. Um, there are many things that I love about Chicago. One being deep dish pizza. Anybody like deep dish pizza? You can get it at Pie here downtown. You can get it. Well, you used to be able to get it here at Uno's. They don't have Uno's here anymore. Uh, a better pizza on uh, in O'Fallon. They make deep dish pizza. But I love deep dish pizza. Giordano's. Um, there's also Gino's East. Oh, my goodness. Let's just leave right now and head to Chicago. <laughs> um, 
I also love Portillo's hot dogs. They have some of the best chocolate cake and some of the best strawberry shortcake you can eat. If you go to Chicago, go to Portillo's, have a hot dog, a, a Chicago style hot dog. There is no Chicago style hot dog like a hot dog in Chicago. So you can go to Steak and Shake and get a Chicago style hot dog. It's not a Chicago style hot dog. Relish on a hot dog is not a Chicago style hot dog. I also love Navy Pier. Navy Pier is beautiful. And the summer we've had this, this year is just amazing. How many have enjoyed the weather this summer? You cannot complain with the weather this summer. Uh, I mean, 70s? Come on. Last year it was like 100, and it was crazy. We've been blessed this year. Uh, hopefully we'll be blessed next year again. Uh, but I love Navy Pier, love the water. We got to take Kingston this last time, and he loves water. So uh, we let him, you know, enjoy that. And, you know, the birds are all flying around, seagulls and stuff. He loves all that. There's a two-story McDonald's also in, in Chicago downtown. Of course, Kingston loves fries, so that's where we had to go. Uh, we, we had to make a trip by there. Um, and then Shedd Aquarium is one of the greatest aquariums in the United States. It's gorgeous. Um, if you go, ask for a student pass, and uh, you'll get it for like $20 cheaper. Uh, it's a great aquarium, though. They've got like a, a great white shark there uh, on display. they got this whole wall. There's this one room where you, it's above you, beside you, and around you, everything. And if you like uh, stuff like that, the zoo just had the uh, new sea lion display. It's awesome at the zoo, and it's free. It's gorgeous. We took uh, Kingston there, and uh, he loved it. Um, so I love taking trips. I love Chicago, but there's, there's this one place in Chicago that I do not like. And it was at the intersection of 64 and 59, uh, highway 64 and highway 59. And my parents know this as well, because at this intersection, there is a yield sign, but not only is there a yield sign, there is a red light camera. So if you do not stop at this yield sign, you get a ticket sent in the mail. I mean, yield, come on, it means slow down, right? It doesn't mean stop, right? Can I get an amen? Come on. If they wanted you to stop, put a stop sign up, right? Okay. Lucky for me, though, uh, my name was not registered on the vehicle. <laughs> it was my father-in-law's vehicle. <laughs> so he got the tickets sent to him in the mail, and then he gladly sent it to me. So I, didn't, I wasn't so lucky in the end. Uh, but yield signs are often thought to be signs that simply mean to slow down, right? Or pause before proceeding. However, as I learned, it really means to stop unless the coast is clear. So to yield means to stop unless the coast is clear. See, sometimes we're guilty of doing to the Holy Spirit what I did at the intersection of 64 and 59 in Chicago. We fail to yield. And the scriptures tell us to yield to those in authority over us. It also tells us to live our lives yielded to God and his will. It oftentimes seems easier, however, to do what pleases us than to submit or to yield to another. Amen? Amen. Today, our postmodern culture is screaming out personal rights. Personal rights, personal rights. Isn't that the truth? It seems like it, there's always some group screaming personal rights. We have a right to this. We have a right to this. We have a right to this. But the scripture seems to emphasize giving up those personal rights time and time and time again. It's not about your personal rights. It's about the ability to give up those personal rights for his spirit and for his will. And this is pre pretty evident in the passage that we just read when these servants meet the master. Jesus is put on the spot by his mom, and so are the servants, though. I mean, the servants have never met Jesus either. And how many people have ever had their mom put you on the spot? Now, it was probably a long time ago, right? You were probably a child, but I remember, I remember times where my mom, you know, they'd be meeting another family or something like that. And it's somebody you never even heard of. Somebody you never knew. You just heard right before you got to that place that your, your families were meeting up or something. And my mom's like, hey, Anthony, this is Daniel. Daniel, this is Anthony. Okay, y'all go play. 
I mean, that's kind of how it goes sometimes, you know, and mothers just seem to put you on the spot sometimes. And I can see Mary doing this, right? She's basically saying, okay, Jesus, this is Jimmy. Jimmy, this is Jesus. Okay, now y'all go and y'all go have a good time, all right? Do whatever he tells you, okay? I know y'all haven't met each other. Go. So it's, it's kind of, everybody's put on the spot here. And Jesus says to fill the pots with water. Now, these servants had to be thinking, now, I've been, I've been a servant here for some time, you know, and I, I'm no expert on wine, but I've looked at a cookbook or two, <laughs> and I, I've never seen water as a replacement for wine in any, of the, in any of the cookbooks that I've read. They had to be thinking that, right? You know, water, really? Water? Instead of, we're, we're trying to make wine, right? Could, could some grapes be involved, maybe? Uh, you know, maybe even some, you know, something from concentrate, you know. I know it's not the real deal, but something that tastes similar to what we're used to. Water? I hate water. <laughs> I hate water. Water tastes like nothing. And all of a sudden, everything they know, everything they feel in this moment seems to slam against the will of the master doesn't it? Turning water into wine? Why do I need to get water for wine? Everything in me tells me that water does not create wine. And there is a slamming of the will of the servants versus the will of the master. But because they yield, they end up creating the best wine of the night. Now hear me, when we yield, always know that the outcome will be the best. When we yield, the outcome will always be the best. It doesn't matter how dumb it seems. It doesn't matter how chaotic it seems. It doesn't matter how out in the galaxy it seems and so far from ordinary. But God is good at turning impossible situations into the best outcome that it could ever be. Amen? How many many are a witness to the fact that God takes something from nothing... And he always makes it the best that it can be. We see that in our families. We see that in the church. We see that through miracles time after time after time. Jesus creates nothing. He takes nothing and he creates the best. And it seems to me in the scripture, tell me if I'm wrong, but with Jesus, whenever you lose something, you always gain something. Whenever you, if you give something up, if he asks you to give something up, he always gives you something that's so much greater than what you gave him. I mean, how much greater is a life full of joy than a life full of depression? How much greater is a life full of joy and happiness and peace than a life full of pleasure in cocaine? How much greater is joy in the kingdom being around great people that, that positively influence you than being around pleasure and for a night. There is no comparison, right? There is no comparison. With Jesus, when you lose something, you always gain something greater. Now, King Saul seemed to have a problem with this biblical principle of yielding, didn't he? In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we find Saul being told some instructions from God, from the prophet Samuel, and he doesn't fully comply. So let's read this portion of text. 1 Samuel chapter 15, we're going to read a little bit here, okay? But we're reading in the NIV so it doesn't, so it's a little bit more up to date. Here we go. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camel and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Telaim. Sorry, Telaim. Apologize. 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. 
Then he said to the Kenites, Go away, leave the Amalekites, so that I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Hevilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with a Saul. But Saul and the army spared Agag. Everybody said he spared him. And the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good, these they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. That makes no sense to me, as if this made sense to Saul. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all the night, all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, but he was told Saul has gone to Carmel. There he was set up, uh, there he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, he acts like everything's okay, doesn't he? Saul acts like everything's okay. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of the cattle that I hear? Saul answered, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep. Hey, we spared the best. This is totally for God. This isn't for me. This is totally for God. We spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, Saul said. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did, not, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people. The Amalekites wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Pretty clear, isn't it? Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Man, it's easy to pounce on the plunder and give everything that's left over to God, isn't it? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, and here's what I love about this story. Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than what? Sacrifice. sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Man, he hits that pretty strong, doesn't he? Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. So Saul is told by God to destroy the Amalekites, right? right. And he's pretty descriptive. He says, do not spare them. That's pretty descriptive, isn't it? But then if that's not descriptive enough, he goes on down the line on what things he should destroy. Right. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. All those things you're supposed to totally destroy, right? right. So Saul gets down to Amalek and he starts destroying the Amalekites, right? And after he kills all the men and the women, he starts killing the animals. And he gets to the sheep and he starts thinking, man, we sure could use a little bit more wool. I mean, who doesn't want to be warm in the winter, right? What God wouldn't want his creation to be warm? What God wouldn't want his people to be blessed? I mean, think of how many blankets we could make with all these sheep. Think of how many infants and how many children we could clothe. Think of how many women and how many men could be warm in the winter because of all this wool. All right. Maybe if I bring them back as sacrifices, God will be okay with it. And he stops yielding to God and starts appeasing his own will. And once Saul gets back to town, the prophet Samuel tells Saul, I hear sheep. I hear cattle. Didn't the Lord tell you to destroy everything? 
And then Saul brings up a couple of excuses, right? He, you know, he was, you know, Saul was, knew what he was doing. You know, Saul knew what he was doing. Saul knew that he was bringing this back for the, for him. It was for his people. It, yeah, he was going to keep some for God, but he was going to keep them for his people too. And then after Saul gives up all these excuses, Samuel says, hey, listen, Saul, today the kingdom is being taken from you. But here's why. To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed or yield is better than the fat of rams. Let me put this in today's terms. To yield in obedience is more valuable than our worship. To yield in obedience is more valuable than our worship. To yield to God telling us to forgive is more valuable than our praise. That's what Samuel's saying here. To yield to what God is telling you to do today in this service, at noon or at one o'clock, whichever service it is, whatever God's telling you today, that is more important than you raising a hand and being disobedient. That is more valuable than you disobeying and still coming to the altar and looking like everything's okay. That is more valuable than you coming up with excuses to say, I did it all for God. In fact, I I think of a scripture that talks about when when people are in heaven. It's judgment day. And people say, hey, we casted out devils in your name. Hey, we did all this stuff in your name. And he said, depart from me. I never knew you. Could it be that the reason why that, that is happening is because they were never obedient. That they used his name. That they used his name to cast out devils. They used his name to minister. They used his name to worship. But they were never obedient to the voice of God. Completely obedient. Completely yielding. We better make sure that every time we feel God speaking to our heart, that there is a complete yes. Amen? Amen. We cannot waste one time coming into a service and and not listening to the voice of God. We cannot take one time stopping and, and turning the other way from what God is trying to say to this church, to my life, to our youth group, to our adults, whoever it is. We can't take one time passing up the will of God. And if you remember anything today, remember this. True yielding hasn't happened until you've yielded in the midst of friction. True yielding hasn't happened until you've yielded in the midst of friction. It sure is easy to say yes when I like it. It sure is easy for me to go get ice cream after church. It sure is easy to go and get a burger after church. But when my wife tells me I need to lose a few pounds, you know, or if she's like, hey, this is our fast day, you know, I got to listen to God. Hey, today it's time to fast, even though my flesh wants a burger. It's easy for me to say yes when it's convenient. It's not as easy because true, it's not as easy when it's not because true yielding hasn't happened until you've yielded in the midst of friction. Hear me, you haven't yielded until you want to go and God tells you to stay. You haven't yielded until you want to go and God tells you to stay. You haven't yielded until you want to give $10 and God tells you to give $20. You haven't yielded until you want to keep it all and God says give me 10%. You haven't yielded until you don't want to get involved in the church and God says I'm calling you to a higher place. It's not until we yield and say yes in the midst of friction that we have completely yielded. Otherwise, it's not true love and it's not true yielding. And that's what we found out about Saul. When everything was going his way, when he was king, it's easy. But whenever there's something that goes against my flesh... When there's, when there's something that goes against my dreams, when there's something that goes against my plans and my future and my destiny, according to me, of course. Because like we said, whenever you give up something, God always gives you something better. That's just the way yielding works to the Spirit. 
So true yielding hasn't happened until you've yielded in the midst of friction. Let's say it together. True yielding hasn't happened until you've yielded in the midst of friction. Has anybody felt that? Oh, man, isn't there a time in a service where you didn't want to go to the altar and the Lord was just tugging on your heart? You got to go. You got to get there. You got to repent. You got to get to the altar. And because you yielded, God blessed you. And because I yielded, God blessed me. It's continually yielding and always saying yes when our flesh doesn't want to say yes. There's another story about a man named Jonah. And I'll read to you Jonah 1, 1, verse, uh, 1 through 3. It's up on the screen. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, Jonah son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And only three lines into the story we find this. Uh, verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. We're only three verses into this chapter and Jonah gets a little bit of friction and he's out the door, isn't he? Good to see you, Uncle Roger. There's a little bit of friction and Jonah runs away from the Lord and heads to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa. There he found a ship bound for the port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. God tells jo Jonah to go to Nineveh. And it so happens that the one place Jonah doesn't want to be is Nineveh. Now, is there anybody in this house, God's done that to you before? Like, oh man, God's telling you to forgive that one person <laughs> that did that one thing, that one time that you haven't forgotten about yet. And he's like, you know, you need to forgive them, Sean. You know, I know you've forgiven everybody else, Sean, but that person who took your chocolate chip cookie last Sunday, that's the person I'm telling you to talk to. And Sean loves chocolate chip cookies. And I love chocolate chip cookies too. But when the Lord... <laughs> when the Lord <laughs> Isn't that how the Lord works, though? It's that one thing. It's that one thorn in the flesh that God keeps hitting at. This is the one thing I want you to do. I know you don't like this. I know you don't like Nineveh. I know you don't like the people. But I want to save a nation. And so if it, if it causes a little friction in your flesh, I'm willing to go through that. The question is, are we? See, it's easy to do the things that we like. When, when I tell Kingston to eat a French fry, you think I have a problem with Kingston? Kingston loves French fries. It doesn't matter if we're at Steak and Shake. It doesn't matter if we're at Five Guys. It doesn't matter if we're at McDonald's. He will eat any French fry. Most kids will. Cheerios, he'll do those for a little while too. And then he wants the French fry. When I tell Kingston to drink his bottle when he's hungry... He wants a bottle. Evelyn's the same way, right? When, when, I, when he tells Evelyn to drink her bottle, he has no problem. But when I tell Kingston to not touch the plant, the one plant that Kingston wants to touch, Kingston has a problem. Now, we don't have a problem coming to church later. We get to sleep in. We don't have a problem with the Ten Commandments. But when God tells us to pray a little bit more, and take those 10 minutes that we could have slept 10 minutes longer and sacrifice for his kingdom. Or he tells us to forgive, like I said, that one person that we've had a thorn in our flesh about. That's when it becomes difficult. But see, God sees things that we don't see. God sees into the future, doesn't he, Brother Sean? God sees things in the future that we don't see. See, while Saul was contemplating whether to obey God or not, God was looking into the future. God saw Saul on his own sword, killed by an Amalekite. He saw himself being killed by the one thing he wouldn't yield to. He saw that far into the future. The very thing that he kept alive ended up being what killed him. See, God saw the rain a hundred years down the road while... He was asking Noah to build an ark. Noah couldn't see that. For a hundred years, Noah couldn't see that. But God saw that. God saw millions of firstborns dead when he asked the Israelites to put blood on the doorpost. 
They didn't see that, but God saw that. See, most of the time God's trying to keep us from stuff. He's kind of keep, trying to keep us safe. God saw Joseph saving Israel when Joseph was in a prison cell. God saw a nation turning to God when he allows Daniel to be thrown in a lion's den. And that doesn't seem like God's will, does it? God doesn't want this for me. This doesn't seem positive. This seems like a step backward. But yielding does not always look positive in the beginning. But it always equals more in the end. Why? Because God sees things that we don't see. And so we yield because of that. Because God knows what's best. Would you stand with me? So when we come in contact today with a master and he tells us to do something we really don't want to do, know that true yielding hasn't happened until we've yielded in the midst of friction. That I haven't really completely given myself until there comes a point where God wants me to do something that my flesh doesn't want to partake of. Pastor, you're telling me to be a little bit more faithful? Pastor, you're telling me I need to do that. You want me to help out this area? You want, you want me to be involved here? It might not feel good in the flesh, but it feels good in the spirit. And that's where the, where the friction is. And when we feel that friction, we have to remember time and time again, say yes. I yield my life. Not just when I want it, but when I don't want it. When it doesn't taste good to my mouth, I'm still going to yield to your spirit. Would you close your eyes with me as we're closing? Jesus, Lord, you know we've all gone through times where we didn't want to yield. You know we've all been in situations where we didn't want to give in to your spirit, where we didn't want to submit to your will. But I'm praying today in this service, in this main service today, I'm praying, Lord, that you would help us. Give us the strength. Give us the courage to yield in the midst of friction. Give us the courage to say yes when our flesh wants to say no, God. Help us to truly yield our bodies, to truly yield our minds, to truly yield our spirits to your kingdom. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. In Jesus' name, let your will be done today. Not my will, God. Not my will, God. Not what appeases me, God. But what is pleasing to you, Father? I give myself away every time, every time, every time. When there's friction, every time. When I like it, every time. When I don't like it, every time. I give myself away. I yield myself. In Jesus' name, let's worship him as we close. We love you, Jesus. Thank you so much for your spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness.